Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight for our Socialist Night School on building working class politics in the suburbs. Uh, as many of us know, the institutions of the modern Democratic Party, like the Democratic National Committee, major advocacy groups, um, state parties, and their allies on cable news tend to believe that the future of the party is in the white collar suburbs uh, and that the past is in the blue collar central cities. As Chuck Schumer infl infamously said in 2016, for every blue collar Democrat we lose in Western Pennsylvania, we will pick up two moderate Republicans in the suburbs in, in Philadelphia. And you can repeat that in Ohio and Illinois and Wisconsin. This year, that same strategy eked out a win at the presidential level while leaving um, many challenges below at the congressional and the state levels. This state of play understandably leaves many socialists stunned and seemingly at the seemingly obvious danger for the broader left and continuing to allow the hollowing out of a party that used to have a much stronger labor and working class constituency. Yet to reject organizing in the suburbs um, among the professional managerial class, the PMC, simply because de Democrats covet them as a replacement base uh, would be to let our political culture substitute for a proper analysis of material conditions. So engaging in some of uh, the material analysis that we need is the purpose of tonight's panel. First, I'll give a, a brief uh, under 10 minute introductory statement, and then I'll invite the panelists uh, to introduce themselves. After that, we'll have uh, eight rounds of questions where some of the panelists have indicated special interest in the topics, and we'll, we'll kind of have a loose discussion at that time uh, based on, on those questions. And then there will be 20 minutes of question and answer from the audience. Uh, and it's a, it's a good audience that we have here tonight. Um, for now, I'll just give you their names. Uh, we have with us tonight, uh, Colette Shade. Uh, she's a longtime writer and left journalist who's recently been contributing uh, to the New Republic and is now studying for her master's in social work at the University of Maryland. Uh, Karen Narevsky is a contributor to Jacobin Magazine and senior organizer for equitable economic development at the Association for Neighborhood Housing Development in New York. Lily Geismer is a contributor to Jacobin Magazine and professor of history at Claremont McKenna College. And I'm sorry to announce that uh, Gabriel Winant, who's a, a professor of history at the University of Chicago and has, has written on these subjects, was gonna join us tonight, but he had what, quote, two interlocking emergencies uh, that I, they did not appear to be life-threatening, but certainly uh, very time-sensitive. So unfortunately, he's not able to join us tonight. And uh, we're, we're sad about that, we, but we've still got a stellar panel here with us tonight. Um, so I could not be more grateful to our panelists uh, for their time this evening. A little bit about myself, I'm Michael Gremko. I've been a DSA member since August of 2016. Um, I'm a member of the Texas State Employees Union, and uh, I'm a card-carrying member of the, the professional managerial class because I'm a lawyer with a bar card, literally. Um, so I have to stress that my uh, opinions here tonight are solely my own. Um, but I also live in the suburban part of Austin, the southwestern part of town anchored by uh, Circle C and, and Travis Country. And since 2016, I've split my activist time primarily between two membership organizations. One would be Austin DSA and the Democratic Club closest to me in the, which is the Circle C area Democrats. Uh, I was thrilled when Heidi Sloan ran her campaign in my congressional district because it allowed me to link both of these ways of participating uh, up and uh, you know, ha have a real issues uh, discussion in my part of town. Uh, since the George Floyd uprisings, I've been working with some of my neighbors to build a loose organizing network uh, to support the Black Lives Matter movement uh, in town, such as it is. And as we know, Austin DSA has been an important part of that coalition work. My personal project within that group is to build up class consciousness within that uh, framework and context. Um, 
this panel is meant to float between theory and activism and ask questions that we need to. Uh, on the left, when talking about the suburbs, it's impossible to escape the issue of the professional managerial class or strata, depending on what you think it is. Uh, but not all suburban dwellers are professional managerial class members. Likewise, when talking about the suburbs, it's impossible to escape the issues of segregation and racism, but certainly not all suburban dwellers are white. Um, to organize in the suburbs is to confront these ambiguities and try to figure out both who your allies are and in a lot of cases, what your project is. The suburbs are a place the people in the suburbs are a conglomeration of competing interests and perspectives. And what exactly can be built there? Before I turn it over to the panel, I'll shortly opine that I believe the Democrats have it backwards. Um, if any organizing is to be done in the suburbs, it should be the slow long-term project and the junior partner to a political formation centered in the broader working class as opposed to the short-term replacement for an increasingly unsupportive working class, which is, I believe, how the Democratic Party sees it. Broadly, we should be trying to offer an alternative explanation for feeling financially squeezed, uh, which is capitalism, the threat of unemployment, um, the stress of student loan debt, the burden of childcare and elder care, the dreariness of traffic uh, to make it mundane, uh, and the mental health burden of holding it all together, which is something um, Ms. Shade has, has written on, as opposed to the, uh, the, the explanation offered by the right, which is immorality and high taxes. And we're very familiar with uh, the right wing uh, narratives that, we've, that have been uh, so um, dominant over the last 40 years. So I believe it's a myth that suburbanites are always on the knife edge of conservatism and that it is more accurate to say that the suburbs contain a mix of political leanings with a very organized right wing and at present a barely conscious left wing. So um, it may be said in retrospect that in 2020, uh, both Sanders and Warren uh, both failed uh, to unite the professional managerial class with the broader working class in, but they sort of failed in opposite ways. Warren tried to build from the professional managerial class out. Uh, and for a while, she had suburbanites talking about real needs like uh, childcare and student loan forgiveness and things like that. And Sanders tried to build from the broader working class in. And I think that uh, as we can see with what happened in the Nevada caucus, the Sanders approach uh, has a lot of promise, um, but it also needs time and effort to be uh, successful. And uh, also the, the, I think what it tells us is that the professional managerial class should not be at the center of the project of, of building an electoral force that can win within the Democratic Party or in the general, but that it's necessary to uh, organize there and should not be ignored entirely. So the question is, what does it look like to organize the PMC into working class consciousness? And so we've invited this panel here to shed light on these kinds of questions. And with that, let's talk to our panelists. Each of you have uh, two minutes to introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about your work and your interest in this topic of building working class politics in the suburbs. And I, I have to open my, uh, my stopwatch here. I'm not gonna be too, uh, Two nuts about that, but could we start with Colette Shade? Hi everyone, I'm Colette Shade. I am a master's student at the University of Maryland School of Social Work and I'm learning to be a therapist. And I also write about mental health. I used to write about a lot of other topics coincidentally, including the suburbs, but I, after I, took this different career trajectory, I decided that I wanted to combine my kind of future day job with my existing writing. So I write about the intersection of mental health, culture, and politics. And I'm currently working on a book called This Sucks. And I'm, 
I can't really talk about it that much because um, I think my agent wouldn't be too happy because we're about to go into uh, acquisition meetings. But um, yeah, it's called This Sucks. And it's about how politics ruined your mental health. Thank you very much. And uh, what, what can we continue on with uh, Lily Geismer? Hi, um, thanks so much for having me here. I should say I've, I've never been to Austin and I've always wanted to go. So this is as close as I'm, I'm getting for now. Um, but um, I am, um, as Michael mentioned, a historian. Um, and so I approach these questions kind of from a historical perspective. Um, my research is primarily focused um, on liberalism and the Democratic Party and particularly its transformations. Um, I wrote a book um, that um, came out in 2015 um, called Don't Blame Us, Suburban Liberals and the Transformation of the Democratic Party. In that book, I looked at the activities and priorities of professionals who live along the Route 128 um, corridor outside of Boston, which is kind of the um, Silicon Valley of the Boston area. Um, and I looked at this, these, this sort of these communities um, as a way to show not the um, demise, but the reorientation and transformation of liberalism away from urban ethnics in labor unions um, to suburban knowledge workers and high tech corporations. And um, the purpose of the book was to sort of look, at, contend that um, that shift has contributed to both the persistence of, of the Democratic Party, um, but it also intensified racial and structural inequality in the United States. Um, in doing the research for the book, and it looked for, at the period sort of from the 50s to the 80s, um, I found a great deal of affluent activism among affluent white suburban residents on issues like civil rights, feminism, environmentalism. But I found that these um, suburban liberals were most um, sort of progressive and active or supportive on issues that were the furthest away from their um, from their um, pocket from sort of pocketbook issues, especially their um, homeowner, the sort of the prior the, the I guess the politics of homeownership, like property values. Um, property taxes and their children's education. Um, and so that was it, it sort of understanding and often per, uh, sort of, uh, I guess, favored um, individual solutions to structural problems. So those have been the, the kinds of, um, that was kind of the, the, the contradictions that I found. I think that actually contributed to, to shaping the priorities of the Democratic Party writ large. Um, in my, I've done a fair amount of writing about these issues um, beyond the book for popular audiences. Um, and one of the things I think that's really important is that um, this group of people of sort of affluent suburban, white suburban residents um, hold a tremendous amount of political capital. I think we've seen that, um, especially in the, the recent elections. Um, and I think that it's sort of been one of the sort of pro real problems of that and why I'm excited to be part of this panel is that in it's in the kind of relentless focus on affluent suburbanites um, has been overlooking the fact um, that those are not the only people who live in the suburbs. Um, and I think they're really important lessons for going forward, um, especially for the Democratic Party and um, political activism more broadly. Um, and I would say one place I think that's been really important for, for these questions has been um, in the recent mobilizations, both in Georgia and Arizona, which sort of point to different types of constellations and different ways of thinking about what suburban politics and suburban activism looks like. So thank you very much. I'm happy to talk more. And um, Karen Norevsky. Great. Um, I'm also really happy to be here. Thank you so much, Michael, for inviting me. Um, my name is Karen Norevsky. Um, I'm sort of my career is in community development and community organizing. I've done a lot of um, community-based um, organizing work around housing issues, around jobs, um, a lot of it labor adjacent. And I've worked in partnership very often with unions. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the really interesting issues is thinking about how in the context of so-called community organizing, how neighborhood groups engage with labor. Um, so I don't live in the suburbs. I live in New York City. Um, I actually wrote the Jacobin piece um, that you all may have read, the suburbanization of the US working class about six years ago. Um, and at that time, uh, I did live uh, in what could be called a suburb of Boston, but also could be called like an inner ring city, um, Somerville, uh, which is in some ways similar to 
um, a lot of like gentrifying urban neighborhoods, but is technically outside of like the Boston metropolitan or the Boston like municipal boundaries. So anyway, at that time, I was very much thinking about issue based and local political organizing and not about national electoral work. Um, so I'm really glad um, that Lily's piece kind of builds on and updates that theme. And it's certainly something that I've thought a lot about more in the years since then. Um, and like part of what was really interesting to me at that time was the tension between um, historically the early appeal of suburban living to um, like affluent middle-class people and also the changing infrastructure of what our cities look like. So, you know, in early America, cities were sort of like resource centers by default, uh, but they were also gross and full of uh, factories and recent immigrants and disease and um, was something that really like if you have the resources you wanted to escape from. Um, and I think that has really shifted um, and you know we don't have to I think there's a lot in the the dialogue around gentrification that's happened in the last few years that's maybe not productive in the way we think about these things but certainly the fact that like a lot of what we would call the PMC now, actually, they live in cities. They don't necessarily all live in the suburbs. Um, and, you know, we can distinguish between different kinds of suburbs, um, suburbs like Somerville or other 128 suburbs like Newton or Wellesley versus, um, you know, what Mike Davis was referring to in his recent dig interview as like the exurbs. So there's really like a lot of complexity here in thinking both about the geographic context and also um, about the political context. Um, and I'll just wrap up by saying that um, I'm also very active in New York City DSA. Um, and we have been doing obviously a lot of electoral organizing, but also really trying to adapt like a, an electoral style field program to issue based organizing. And I think that's something that potentially um, could be really promising in organizing outside of urban contexts where it's really easy to do. Um, you know, to do like more relational organizing, people know each other. Um, so we've been, especially since the pandemic, doing a lot of phone banks, thinking about how to do field programs in a more remote way. Um, and we'll see if it works, but i um, interested in thinking about organizing strategies um, sort of outside of the workplace and outside of a traditional like dense neighborhood. Well, thanks very much. Um... Well, let's move on to some of the the questions that we um, uh, were were talking about. I do also want to stress that I know I opined a bit at the beginning, but uh, you guys are the experts, so uh, you know, please feel free to uh, uh, disagree, modify anything um, to to some of those statements. Uh, so that that was simply uh, you know based on on what I what I've been uh, picking up, but. I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, so um, the first question that, that we had was just to court, just sort of a uh, a way to set the scene is, you know, what is the economic and social function of a suburban community in the United States? Um, I think that uh, Ms. Shade had um, some thoughts on that, so I'll, I'll send it to her. Well, now I'm feeling kind of silly because I think, you know, Lily has actually studied uh, it academically and I have not. I've just, you know, I only have life experience and then Karen also has um, organizing experience um, in suburbs. But I think that, I mean, well, I we, think- as We can get a discussion going, so it's, it's all right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, my, again, I'm coming from a perspective of um, so when I, I've, I lived in suburbs growing up, um, so I lived, um, in, so I lived in Falls Church, Virginia, which is an inner ring suburb in Northern Virginia, um, which is, it's interesting because it's like, like if you look at the actual data for what people are making, it's very high. But there's also, but if you actually look um, like neighborhood by neighborhood, there's a lot of poverty, especially in the Eastern part. And there's a lot of immigration. Like I believe at one point, um, 
the uh, zip code where I live like rivaled Queens as most diverse in the country in terms of people from different nationalities. Um, and so I think that was my first exposure to this idea that like when I saw suburbs depicted in media, it was always white people and a white picket fence. And I was like, uh, okay, well, what about like the Somalian restaurant or the underground Vietnamese nightclub? Like it just didn't really feel reflective of what I was seeing. Um, and then I moved, my family moved to a suburb outside Baltimore, um, which I should say Baltimore and DC, despite their proximity, are very different cities uh, historically and economically. Um, and, and for that reason, they're both their demographics and their sort of, um, you know, the, the sort of, I think the, the, their economies are different, their, their culture is different. Um, and the suburb that like I went to high school in was a very old sort of like, I compare it to like mainline Pennsylvania where it's very horsey. Um, you know, it's almost, it's like 90% white and it's very sort of old money as well as professionals, um, sort of upper PMC. So um, lawyers, uh, heads of hospitals, doctors at Johns Hopkins, things, people, in, people at T. Rowe Price, things of that nature. Um, and that was very, very different culturally and politically, much, much, much more conservative, although it's been interesting to actually see Black Lives Matter signs in that neighborhood, which I do not think would have happened, not to get a historical here, but I, I, I don't think that that is something that I would have seen, you know, when I was going to high school in the early 2000s. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think this is just to say that I think there are so many different kinds of suburbs, you know, there's your exurbs, there are these, like, there are these suburbs that are, you know, have always been working class because they're based around a factory. So for instance, in Eastern Baltimore County, that is a big thing. And so there's been a lot of deaths of despair in these, in these, suburb, in these suburban communities that have lost their main gainful source of employment. Um, then you have also infill from um, people moving in from like, essentially uh, immigrants from Central America and other places who can no longer afford the DC suburbs. So they're selecting Baltimore because it's a little cheaper. So I think it's like, I guess this is all to say it's extremely complicated and confusing and suburbs are not monolithic. <laughs> I'll just jump in for a second um, to add both to what Colette said, and I think also Karen about the sort of complexities of defining what a suburb is. And um, there was a comment in the chat about this too, but I think I teach a class called American Suburbia and its Consequences. And we spend like the first couple of weeks sort of trying to figure out the definitions of suburbs. And I think every, there's so many conflicting definitions. Scholars actually don't have um, the answer either. I mean, I think that there's been all these different ways that they're, they're very vague ways that the sort of census des describes what a suburb is, which is like the area outside of a city. And there's just a bunch of different sort of different types of categories in which to sort of make sense of this. And I think for the question of thinking about the kind of class politics, it's particularly complicated, um, given a point that um, that Karen made about the fact that many people who are part of the PM, like who are the sort of PMC or the at like the kind of affluent suburbanites I have spent a long time studying um, now live in um, what would be considered cities like Brooklyn or sort of communities. And I think some of the politics have actually been reproduced to those particular areas, even though they're not necessarily kind of seen as suburbs. At the same time, one of the things that's happened is that um, suburban communities have become much more um, diver diverse and um, in terms of sort of, econ sort of economically and racially. Um, and I think it was Leslie had said that she grew up in Levittown, which now looks dramatically different than it did in the 1940s and is pri primarily actually a, Latin, a Latinx community. Um, and so I think one of the things that's kind of, it, it, those, that sort of creates 
a lot of the kind of challenges of thinking about these types of um, these types of questions as sort of how to make sense of these particular things. I also just as one final point to that, and I think this went to what um, Colette was saying too, is that I, we talk about the suburbs becoming more um, more diverse, um, and that's not to say that they're kind of like a racial utopia, like wherever. I mean, I, they, they're, they, there's still a lot of segregation within suburban communities based on race and class lines. And I think that's one of the questions about kind of trying to make create coalitions or organizing across them. Um, added to the fact that there's spatial, there's a there's spatial dimensions that would make that make it really challenging. And I imagine this is something Karen has confronted in various different kinds of work that like that having those kinds of talent, the, 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 the space, space, space matters in trying to create coalitions. And I think it's been something that's been really hard um, within suburban communities. So those are a few thoughts. Yeah, I just will build on that because it reminds me of like an interesting anecdote um, from several years ago. Um, you know, I think in many ways, like one of the key pieces that defines, um, you know, where you live and where you can afford to live, or not defines, but is, is defined by where you can afford to live is how long you spend commuting to work. Um, and so, you know, there's a trade off there, obviously, between if you assume that most people are working in an urban center. Do you want to have a short commute time, but maybe less space, um, you know, kind of more, more noise, more distractions, whatever? Or do you want to have a longer commute time, but maybe um, a little bit more of a, um, of a suburban lifestyle? And I think what we're seeing increasingly as, as cities gentrify and as prices go up is that people, uh, like working class people, are sort of squeezed to, into a situation where they actually have neither. So people are spending hours commuting to work. Uh, people live really far outside of, um, of job centers, but also are really living in like, you know, conditions that are really different from like the stereotypical white picket fence suburb. Um, so there was a recent New York Times piece about um, some of the neighborhoods in Los Angeles that are really, have been really hard hit by COVID-19. And even though Los Angeles is famously like a very dense, sprawling, um, sort of typically suburban county, people are living with like many families packed into a big suburban house because they can't afford to live on their own. So you have people who are living both really far away from jobs and spending a ton of their time commuting and without the resources that we expect suburban living to bring. Um, but the fact that people are spending so long commuting really is a challenge in terms of organizing both for non-workplace issues and even for workplace issues. So when I was in Somerville, I did work closely with um, Unite Here Local 26 um, that organizes food service workers. Um, and I heard from one of the shop stewards that they were having trouble finding a time to schedule meetings because so many of the union members had moved far out of the, far out of the city as far away as New Hampshire and they had to spend an hour and a half or two hours after work driving home and they didn't want to stay after work for a union meeting that was going to end at 10 o'clock and then they'd have to drive home. So I think figuring out how to reach people and how to engage them when people now really are spending a lot of time commuting and are sort of um, pushed out of the spaces where they, um, you know, they're in the space to work and then they're, they're like leisure spaces somewhere else is, is a really like important and thorny challenge to think about. I think that that brings us actually, I think we kind of sort of moved into the second question already. So I'll just, I'll just put out what the second question was, which was, you know, should we think of the suburbs as a place uh, where that are predominantly working class or predominantly PMC or both or something else, uh, you know, you guys want to chime in on, on, on those issues, but I think we were kind of rolling into that anyway. Um, well, I think, I mean, one of the things is there's this cultural sensibility of suburbs as, I mean, sort of the that suburbs as these kind of affluent spaces, which I think obscure so many of the other kinds of realities. Um, I think another thing, just to add on to the point about some of the challenges, and I, I know this um, also having, I live in, um, in LA, and so it's a place where you can see it really firsthand. But one of the things that the ways that the, the sort of movement of, um, of um, working class and poor people out of urban air, out of sort of urban areas is also a lack of infrastructure that, that occur in, in, um, in communities. So where I, I teach is on the sort of the, um, 
the outskirts of the Inland Empire, and that is that is the kind of epicenter of this kind of of, of much of this kind the kinds of suburb the suburb what I would say is a more suburban poverty. But there's no infrastructure to deal with that. Um, none of the kinds of social services that are traditionally there to to help. And I think that adds another layer. I think coupled with people being in um, having to travel really far for work um, is not any of the kind of infrastructure to even make that kinds of that kind of commuting possible. And so those those add those just add those types of things. So I think that's one of the things is sort of the, this lived reality. There's more poverty in suburban areas and there is in urban areas, but that doesn't necessarily map onto our cultural reality. And I think one of the, the clear places that we saw this was like this, all the kind of ridiculousness of Trump's comments about the suburbs was based on this really outdated version of what suburban communities look like. But I don't think that that, I mean, it was, it, it, they all sounded like they were some sort of like, um, like indie bands, like concept album like the suburban lifestyle dream and stuff but i think that that's actually not necessarily he wasn't alone in that that kind of thinking and i think that um so much of the kind of media and other types of things coupled and, it, and michael mentioned the kind of um the mainstream democratic party's politics focus on that idea of what sort of suburban communities look like so i think that's one of the things that it's there it's hard to say because we have this reality this idea of what the suburbs look like in the kind of large-scale american cultural imagination which doesn't map on at all to what the reality is Someone else want to jump into on that one? Uh, <clears throat> well, okay. I mean, the 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 third uh, question that uh, I posed to the panel was, you know, given that background, given who who lives there, given some of the social trends that see, you know, uh, different people than the than the stereotypes, uh, you know, moving there. Um, you know, what are the economic leverage points in in these places that have so often been thought of as bedroom communities just a place where you lay your head and then you go work elsewhere uh i think i had uh that uh, lily geisper wanted to talk a little bit about that but you know any it, we can have a discussion so I mean, I think, and I think that goes to, I mean, there are shared, the sort of shared experience, I guess, shared experiences of sort of life generally um, and challenges that people face. I mean, I, I and I, one thing I will say is that sort of, um, you know, I, I think um, we can all hate on affluent suburbanites. Um, I've spent like my entire career doing that. But I think that one of the things that um, the, comes up is that there's many hardships that that people um, and people face across kind of class lines um, that deal with kind of, I mean, I think some of the reality, and I think that they've all been brought into really sharp focus in the last year around the pandemic. And so um, issues of childcare are, are, le are sort of leverage points. I think people have, um, I'm trying to think, I mean, I think health, the questions of sort of adequate healthcare um, just basic sort of um, basic ability to kind of get things from your employer. Um, those are all points I think that actually cross certain kinds of um, class and spatial lines. And so there, those might be sort of places of, um, of, I guess if leverage, but also kind of coming together. And I think one thing that I, I found overwhelmingly are, are leverage points for suburban, suburbanites traditional, I guess affluent suburbanites in particular pocketbook issues and especially issues around, um, around children's education. Um, so for better or for worse, that is the, the sort of, the, I think a, a really driving issue um, amongst a particular kind of, kind of educated um, a, a suburban resident. And so that's the place I think that there is potential. It's, it's been a longstanding a place of kind of closing in, but I think there's also a potential there. Yeah, I was actually going to say something similar. I think, yeah, issues like child care, elder care, uh, student debt, um, you know, health care issues. I think these really are, especially as like these kinds of things become so phenomenally expensive that even for middle class suburban families, they're really a huge burden and out of reach. I think they're becoming much more universal and there are potentials to work to organize around that um, in a local way. Um, I think one of the, so I have done a lot of organizing around housing, um, which is a really, is really challenging for a number of reasons. And maybe it's both like an easy place to start because I think a lot of people are sort of familiar with housing um, as a, sort of a thing to organize around and as a topic, but 
it, it's very easy, even in an urban context, I think a lot of housing organizing ends up sort of starting off around opposing a local neighborhood development, which may look really different and have different racial undertones in a suburban single family home context from in an urban um, multifamily like apartment building context and you kind of like touch off people's NIMBY instinct when things are linked to like local property taxes and school funding. Um, but I think things like these broader economic issues like debt and healthcare um, are not necessarily tied to the locality, but you can use the locality as a way to bring people together around um, right these pocketbook issues. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's tricky. Um, you know, I think there's also people develop a sense of themselves that sort of sometimes is, is aligned with reality in terms of where they live and what kind of person they are. And sometimes there's a gap between people's sort of sense of self and the reality. And I think um, I, I'm like less, in, less sort of knowledgeable or have fewer opinions on the kind of definitions around the PMC and how we look at that. I think, um, but I think some of that is really less of a, a kind of, um, you know, quantifiable uh, metric and more of a, of a cultural issue. And so I think um, figuring out how to navigate that is really key to organizing these contexts. I would say one other issue is climate. I think that there's a potential there. I mean, I think that um, I've looked at the ways that environmentalism is actually sort of a, a can be a um, barrier for kind of certain ki types of NIMBY politics. Um, but I think there is a potential, especially that's sort of historically, and I think it still does carry on, but I think that's an issue that kind of transcends a lot of different lines and there's, there's, some, there's potential there. Um. So, uh, and that actually, that does bleed into sort of our next uh, question, which was, you know, for we've kind of talked about uh, who lives there, what kinds of issues might, um, uh, you know, be receptive to people. But, you know, if we could maybe spend a little bit of time breaking down different um, types of, uh, you know, workers who who live in the, in the suburbs. And I'm, I'm asking here, you know, in your assessment, I mean, who do you think uh, is ripe to um, kind of organize into a different, you know, understanding or, or, or class consciousness? You know, I have in mind teachers, nurses, government employees, service workers who also, you know, live in the suburbs. Um, uh, you know, people of color who are your neighbors who experience the, the suburbs differently uh, than uh, your white neighbors. Um, you know, just if, if you guys could, you know, think about that a little bit. And, and uh, I had, uh, oh, that actually, that was going to be Gabriel Winans uh, topic. So if any, if anyone wants to jump in about, uh, you know, maybe Colette uh, has, has touched on, um, you know, this issue of crying at work and uh, yeah. self help acts at the end of the world, this would be an interesting place to put that in. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, there are a few things to say. Um, I mean, I think that I think that mental health can be well, I guess, what are we talking about? We're talking about um, uniting issues. I mean, I think so. First of all, I think that just overall, I think that feeling like you're exploited is galvanizing whatever that might mean. I mean, and I, what's interesting is I've seen a lot of people I know who are sort of upper, upper PMC, like doctors and lawyers and so on, um, really like realize that they're being exploited and be like, yeah, this sucks. I don't like it. Even if I'm making a lot of money and I have a BMW, I, uh, I'm isolated. I'm working like 80 hours a week or more. I... Um, and again, this, but one thing to touch upon too, is that this isn't just a suburban thing. Like, I think these things that I'm saying aren't just relevant to the suburbs, though they are also relevant to the suburbs. They're relevant like to cities, you know, um, to people who are living in these gentrified or gentrifying areas of, you know, Brooklyn or, or Baltimore, or, you know, uh, Cambridge or wherever else. 
Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I guess this sort of segues into my own pet topic, which is mental health. And I think that pretty much all of the leverage points that have been raised have a mental health component here. And, and people have struggled with that in various ways. So commuting is stressful. Commuting, it, you know, it causes all of this stress for you and it's a hassle. And then it can also, you can even look at it from a sort of family dynamics perspective, which is, okay, well, how is all of this time that you're spending this extra, I would argue, unnecessary time that you're spending in your car eating into the amount of time that you would spend with like your spouse or kids? Um, how is that creating more stress in your domestic relationships? Um, and a similar thing I think could be said about, about working hours and working conditions. Um, okay, well, you are working again, you're, and again, this, I think it, it might look a little bit different if you're talking to somebody who is like a service worker versus like a teacher versus a corporate attorney, like their experience of these, of their commute, of struggling to pay for health care, of struggling to save for college, of not having enough time, all of these things, even a feeling of instability, all of these things are applicable to each one of these groups of people. Um, it just might play out a little bit differently. And so I think it can be really I think one of the things that I'm kind of trying to do is to talk about how everyone feels like shit. Like everyone feels, everyone's stressed. They are anxious because they are afraid that, oh no, this bad thing is going to happen in the future because like there is a lot of bad things that could potentially happen or are likely to, to happen or will almost certainly happen on both a macro and micro scale, whether you're talking about climate change or increasing inequality or losing your job. Um, and so people are running around, they're stressed, they're anxious, maybe they're traumatized because they're watching um, these videos of people who are being murdered by police. Maybe they know someone who was murdered by police. I mean, you, you could really pick any one of any one of these these leverage points and tie it into, okay, how does that make you feel? Oh, it makes you feel like shit? Well, maybe there's something we can do about it. So I'll just say um, to, to build on it and think about this somewhat slightly historically, one thing that I found in my, um, in my research of looking at kind of at these affluent suburban communities outside of Boston in the 50s and 60s is a lot of the people who joined um, or sort of politically active organizations were feeling isolated. It was a lot of actually suburban housewives who um, who were, you know, in, who were, it, the, I guess the kind of classic like sort of Phantom Mystique type story, um, but they wanted to get involved in something. And I think that that's, that, this, that finding sort of pe people and commonality is actually a really powerful point of this, this sense of sort of feeling connected. And I think that that actually cuts, cuts a lot of things. One thing about, and I guess this goes to the question of kind of thinking about it as a suburban issue is that often is a local issue that you're sort of you are thinking about people about sort of this the space and place in which they live. But that means about connecting with your your neighbors and the people around and who you and, and who you um, who you live with. And I think feeling connected to those kinds of people. And there's a lot of ways that sort of peeps that, that sort of places, you know, that that works in different kinds of um, spatial constellations, but I think it's a really powerful thing that people are looking to go to, to finding a way of feeling involved and connected can actually be a really powerful leverage point. Um, someone said too, I think another another really important place to look, I saw this in the chat, of, of, of people to kind of think about organizing is tech workers. And so I spent a lot, there's a really rich liter his academic literature on sort of why engineers don't, don't join unions. Um, and that was kind of looking in the 1950s and 1960s about sort of the types of work that um, that kind of um, engineering is, is not conducive to 
sort of organizing or that I could think a lot of kind of professional careers are not are not there are not the kinds of things that would be traditional to, to sort of joining a union. But I think that in the last I mean, that in the last five, 10 years, that's been like eviscerated as a point. And I think that there are a lot of that is a, a really that, that there are a lot of people involved in post industrial work who feel incredibly um, put upon and want and want kind of collective action. And I do think that there's a there's there's a, a, there's a lot of potential there as well. Karen, or did you want to say say something more about this? Yeah, no, I just think that speaks also to the question that Leslie had posted in the chat um, as well about, um, yeah, really workplace organizing. You know, I think sometimes it's like really just a logistical challenge in like a traditional suburb. People just don't live as close together. And so if you're knocking on people's doors, you probably need a car or you want to like have a way to get around. But um, that's true in lots of urban neighborhoods too. There are parts of New York that are mostly single family homes and you're not gonna find necessarily people who live in the same workplace living, um, living right next to each other. So unless you're really organizing like everyone on a block around um, a very, very local issue, I think there's a lot of possibility and probably a lot of existing models um, of really bringing people together um, you know, across shared issues, whether they're workplace issues or um, broader economic issues. Yeah, that kind of brings us to, uh, I guess, this this question that I had here about partisan activism, which um, <clears throat> is something that, um, you know, I kind of felt acutely, uh, you know, being a member of a democratic club, but also being in DSA. And I was sort of uh, uh, in the democratic uh, club, hoping to get some of these, these issues um, to be a, a bigger part of the culture there. But I feel like the, um, uh, the, the barrier that I ran into was, it seemed that a lot of people there sort of organized their political understanding around well, the thing that I'm doing is I'm stepping out and I'm trying to get more Democrats elected, which 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 has a certain logic to it. Um, but you know, maybe another way to frame this is 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 kind of what I said in the beginning was what do we what do we make of the Warren versus Bernie phenomenon in this place? Um, you know, because in the Democratic clubs, uh, Warren among Democratic activists was very popular, Bernie less so. Um, uh, in this area, um, but by the same token, if we if we set aside, you know, what happened toward the end of that campaign, I think what's more important about the Warren campaign is what happened at the beginning was when she was at least ostensibly, you know, for Medicare for all and raising all of these issues, and she became sort of wildly popular, um, you know, in a pack of candidates who are also popular among those people, but she became the favorite. So. Um, if, if you all want to comment on on some of that, I mean, I, it's a it's a, it is. I think it's a challenging question of how much we sort of look or don't look to to party acts to political parties to create social change. And so I think that that's been this kind of there's been that's been this model um, where there's a lot of possibilities and a lot of limitations. Um, and so I mean, there's there's sort of certain things limited to the party structure. Um, but I do think it is a place for sort of cross collaboration if that's a broader, um, a broader goal. And I think that there is a question of kind of the types of progressive that there, that there potentially are progressive candidates who can do well with tradition, who are considered traditional suburban, um, suburbanites. One of the examples that I said, and I think this is, I, th I think this constantly gets trotted out. So I don't know if I'm, but it is Katie Porter in, in California, um, who's managed to sort of, who, who represents like the, um, the area and uh, what is she flipped it? She flipped the district. Um, it's the district around sort of um, the University of California Irvine, but she's managed to sort of on a with a pretty progressive platform um, galvanize a lot of suburban voters, and she 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 won re-election um, this, this in in twenty twenty. So I think that there there is possibility, but I think one of the, the just it's a it's a broader challenging question. I don't know if it's necessarily sort of just based on the suburbs about where where to look to create things and how much the kind of Democratic Party is the um, the locus for particular types of for creating sort of 
larger change. Yeah, I think there's also, there's like a way to do this type of uh, even partisan activism that focuses more clearly on the issues that motivate people and less on the party. I think ultimately, like, it is a good thing to have more people registered to vote as Democrats and more Democrats elected, especially in states where, um, you know, where you have to be registered with a, with a particular party. New York is one of those states. Um, it's very, uh, you must be enrolled in a party. Uh, third party candidates really have no chance of getting elected to any meaningful office. Um, and so, you know, even in, and New York is one of these states that people think of as a, you know, it's a, always a presidentially blue state, but until, um, until 2018 for the, the past century, um, the state Senate was controlled by Republicans. Um, and for many years, the assembly was also controlled by Republicans. It had been Democrat controlled since, um, uh, since like the seventies or eighties, but the Senate was controlled by Republicans for many years, Republican governors and then centrist Democratic governors like the current governor Andrew Cuomo have really worked in partnership with Republicans to block a lot of progressive change at the state level. Um, and so ultimately there's a question like in a case like that, um, it is really important to, to think about how to challenge Republican power and how to get more Democrats elected um, maybe DSA is not always the vehicle to do that, but there are ways that DSA can work in coalition with other organizations. Um, so in 2018, um, you know, a lot of DSA members that I know in New York worked very closely with um, some of the progressive um, electoral organizations in New York um, to replace a lot of the right-wing Democrats who had allied with Republicans in the state Senate. Um, they're not socialists. Sometimes we like them, sometimes we don't. Six out of the eight candidates won. It was a huge deal um, and really paved the way for a lot of the policies and a lot of the campaigns. Um, for a lot of the policies that DSA have been fighting for. Um, and so that is valuable. And I think rather than saying we want these folks in office because they're Democrats, we said we want these people in office because they have promised to implement um, tenant protections because they support Medicare for all, because they're gonna um, you know, address like issues with crime and policing. So there's a way to do it, I think, that's focused more on the issues and less specifically on the party affiliation. So I think like I think I'm gonna actually add on what Karen said and just emphasize it, which is that. I think that a big trap that I've seen, so my mom actually is involved in, um, she's involved in Indivisible in Towson, Maryland, which is her broader suburb. And so it's been interesting because at first they were very, very, cause she got, you know, she, she got involved after Trump was elected in 2016. And at first everything was about elect Democrats, elect Democrats, this and that. and. But I have seen, I don't know about if this is representative of the broader group, but I've seen her more convinced with policy over, over just making sure that, Dem that Democrats win. But, um, and again, Maryland is a, is a state like New York where you have to be affiliated with a party if you want to vote in primaries. Um, but anyway, so I think that I think that a big problem is convincing people, moving them from, okay, Democrats good, Republicans bad, to specific policies. And also the right policies, right? Because I think that I've seen people who are this, are sort of PMC people who have moved left over the years, um, who have really, I don't know if they have the best historical analysis or philosophical analysis of policies. And so what happens is that it's, they're very random and inconsistent in what they support. And so they end up supporting things like there was that initiative this summer, I think it was called the eight can't wait initiative, which was about police reform, but it was extremely minor things that was, and this, 
this eight can't wait. I saw it all over, you know, Instagram with people that I went to undergrad with. They were like, you know, oh yeah, eight can't wait, you know, lawyers and, and so on. And, and it was just like, okay, like, have you really thought through the implications of this? And I think a challenge can be going in there and I guess just trying to figure out how to go in and communicate with people and have a dialogue with them and kind of move them to think a little more critically about what they're supporting as well. Yeah, this is this is not uh, my show, but I will take the uh, the you know this this opportunity to just build off that a little bit. Um, you know, I I saw a tremendous op you know I set out what I thought was sort of my impasse, which was I got this whole chunk of Democrats here that. I'm having a hard time doing issue activism there. Um, but on the other hand, I'm aware of this, uh, you know, coalition that's moving on all these issues like, you know, you know, police reform and re getting, uh, you know, progressive DAs elected. And really the opening that was this summer with Black Lives Matter, where there was a tremendous outpouring of sort of new people in addition to the, to the, to the, some of the people who were also in the democratic club with me and we were able to sort of form this like you know this neighborhood group around that framework and it's kept going on and, and we've we've continued to have discussions and link up with more with that issue coalition uh certainly not hostile to the democratic club but it's a it's a different thing and it, and it hits from a different angle um so I, it's very interesting what you all have said um and that kind of uh I guess dovetails into our next question, which was is about, you know, how do we talk about, you know, race and gender um, in a way that can still ensure or keep open that uh, that dialogue about class solidarity, um, because as we know that, uh, you know, in suburban uh, communities, a lot of times uh, the the way we talk about uh, race and gender is sort of um, can can exclude class analysis, um, or it can sometimes feel that way. So, how do we build, uh, you know, solidarity both both with our neighbors who, uh, you know, are affected by, uh, you know, racism and sexism, um, but also uh, to make sure that we're also uh, having an analysis that that incorporates a, a real class analysis. Um, so I, oh, I had uh, that Colette uh, wanted to talk about that one. Oh boy, you know, I really don't, I, I don't know if I'm the best person to talk about that, to be honest. Sure. Um, well, we, I mean, we could also move on um, to the question phase if we want, if we want to do that. Um, this has been a fantastic panel, but I think that, that uh, you know, we will probably have questions coming in from the audience. Um, let me see if I can pull some of those up. Uh, if y'all want to send in some questions. Uh, I'm not sure the best way to, to manage this here. Mm -hmm. 